Communization by Gilles Dove, published 2011, originally from traploin.fr. This text from the anarchistlibrary.org. If we speak of communization, not just communism, it is not to invent a new concept which would provide us with the ultimate solution to the revolutionary riddle. Communization denotes no less than the content and process of a future revolution. For example, only communization gives meaning to our critique of democracy. In recent years, communization has become one of the radical inwards, even outside what is known as the communizers, communizateurs in French. As far as we are concerned, we do not regard ourselves any more members of this communizing current than we feel close to or far from a number of other communist groups. The communization issue is further complicated by the emergence of the commons theory, according to which deep social change could come from collective usage and extension of what is already treated as common resources and activities. For instance, the open field system and still existing traditional societies and free software access in the most modern ones. In other words, these creative commons would allow us a gradual and peaceful passage toward a human community. The successive refutation of theories we regard as incomplete or wrong would have obscured our central points. As we wish to keep away from any war of the words, the following essay will try and address a communization issue as directly as possible. A few words about the word. In English, the word has been used for a long time to convey something very different from what we are dealing with here. To communize was often a synonym for to Sovietize, i.e. to implement the full program of the Communist Party in the Leninist and later Stalinist sense. Quote, the fundamental task of Comintern was to seek opportunities to communize Europe and North America. End quote. From our service, Trotsky, a biography, Macmillan, 2009, page 282. This was Webster's dictionary definition in 1961 and 1993, and roughly the one given by Wikipedia in 2010. This is, of course, not what we are talking about. More rarely, communization has been used as a synonym for radical collectivization, with special reference to Spain in 1936 to 1939, when factories, farms, rural and urban areas were run by worker or peasant collectives. Although this is related to what we mean by communizing, most of these experiences invented local currencies or took labor time as a means of barter. These collectives function as worker-managed enterprises for the benefit of the people, yet enterprises all the same. We are dealing with something else. It is not sure who first used the word with meaning this essay is interested in. To the best of our knowledge, it was Dominique Blanc, orally, in the years 1972 to 1974, and in writing in Un Monde Sans Argent, A World Without Money, published in three booklets in 1975 to 1976 by the OJTR, the same group who also published D. Blanc's Militancy, The Highest Stage of Alienation. Whoever coined the word, the idea was being circulated at the time in the small milieu around the bookshop La Vieille Taupe. The Old Mole, from 1965 to 1972. Since the May 68 events, the bookseller Pierre Guillaume, ex-socialisme au Barbary, an ex-poivre ouvrier member, but also for a while close to G. de Borde, who himself was a member of SOB in 1960 to 1961, had been consistently putting forward the idea of revolution as a communizing process, maybe without using the phrase. Yet, D. Blanc was the first to publicly emphasize its importance. Umond sans argent said the difference between communist revolution and all variants of reformism was not that revolution implied insurrection, but that this insurrection would have to start communizing society, or would have no communist content. In that respect, Umond sans argent remains a pivotal essay. In a nutshell, the idea is fairly simple. But simplicity is often one of the most difficult goals to achieve. It means that a revolution is only communist if it changes all social relationships into communist relationships. And this can only be done if the process starts in the very early days of the revolutionary upheaval. Money, wage, labor, 
the enterprise is a separate unit in a value accumulating pool, work time is cut off from the rest of our life, production for value, private property, state agencies as mediators of social life and conflicts, the separation between learning and doing, the quest for maximum and fastest circulation of everything. All of these have to be done away with and not just run by collectives or turned over to public ownership. They have to be replaced by communal, moneyless, profitless, stateless forms of life. The process will take time to be completed, but it will start at the beginning of the revolution, which will not create the preconditions for communism. It will create communism. Is it a program? We are not talking about a plan to be fulfilled one day, a project adequate to the needs of the proletarians and ultimately of humankind, but one that would be exterior to them, like blueprints on the architect's drawing board before the house is built. Communization depends on what the proletarian is and does. The major difference between Marx and utopian socialists is to be found in Marx's main concern, the labor-capital-exploitation relation. Because a proletarian is a heart and body of capital, he or she carries communist potentials within himself or herself. When capital stops buying labor power, labor is nothing. So every deep social crisis opens the possibility for the proletarians to try and invent something else. Most of the time, nearly all the time in fact, the reaction is far from communism. But the possibility of a breakthrough does exist, as has been proved by the succession of endeavors throughout modern times, from the English Luddites in 1811 to the Greek insurgents in 2008. This is why it would be pointless to imagine an utterly different society if we fail to understand the present society and how it can move from one to the other. We must consider what communism is, how it could come about, and who would be in the best position to implement the historical change. The self-emancipation of the proletariat is a collapse of capitalism. The Situationist International once suggested we ought to, quote, go back to a disillusioned study of the classical worker movement, end quote, from number 7, 1962. Indeed, to face up to our past, we must break with a legend of a proletariat invariably ready for revolution and, unfortunately, sidetracked or betrayed. However, blowing myths does not mean bending the stick the other way, as if the workers had up to now persistently fought only for reforms, had glorified work, believed in industrial progress even more than the bourgeoisie, and dreamt of some impossible worker-run capitalism. This historical reconstruction replaces one myth by its equally misleading, symmetrical opposite. The past 200 years of proletarian experience cannot be divided into two totally opposed periods, i.e. a first one, closed by the end of the 20th century, during which the proletariat would only have been able to fight for a social program which can now be qualified as capitalist. In a second phase now, when the evolution of capitalism itself would render null and void the labor capitalist option, and the only alternative facing the proletariat would become a simple one, communist revolution or ascent into barbarism. The historical evidence offered for this watershed theory is unsubstantial. Moreover, and more decisively, the mistake lies in the question. No communist revolution has taken place yet. That obvious fact neither proves nor disproves that such a revolution has been up to now impossible. In his analysis of the class struggles in France, 1850, Marx first lays down what he believes to be a general historical principle. Quote, as soon as it has risen up, a class in which the revolutionary interests of society are concentrated finds the content and the material for its revolutionary activity directly in its own situation. Foes to be laid low measures dictated by the needs of the struggle to be taken. The consequences of its own deeds drive it on. It makes no theoretical inquiries into its own task, end quote. Then Marx wonders why, in the Democratic Revolution of February 1848, quote, the French working class had not attained this level. It was still incapable of accomplishing its own revolution. The development of the industrial proletariat is, in general, conditioned by the development of the industrial bourgeoisie. But in 1848, the industrial bourgeoisie did not rule France. The struggle against capital in its own developed modern form and its decisive aspect, the struggle of the industrial wage worker against the industrial bourgeoisie, is in France a partial phenomenon. Nothing is more understandable than 
than that the Paris proletariat sought to secure the advancement of its own interests side by side with those of the bourgeoisie, end quote. Quotation is no proof, and maybe Marx is wrong, but at least let us get his view right. While he regarded full-grown industrial capitalism as a necessary condition for a proletarian revolution, he did not think that the proletarians could and would only fight for reforms for a certain period, until some complete maturity or completeness of capitalism left open one and only one option, revolution. Slicing up history into phases is very useful, except when it becomes a quest for the last phase. In the past, final or moral crisis theoreticians set out to demonstrate, usually with the help of the reproduction schema of Capital's Volume 2, that a phase was bound to come when capitalism would be structurally unable to reproduce itself. All they actually showed was real fundamental contradictions, but, as Marx wrote, contradiction does not mean impossibility. Now the demonstration moves away from schema and figures and sees the impossible reproduction in the capital-labor relation itself. In short, up to now, communist revolution, or a real attempt to make it, has been out of the question because the domination of capital over society was not complete enough. There is some scope for the worker movement to develop socialist and Stalinist parties, unions, reformist policies. So the working class had to be reformist. And the most it could do was to go free worker managed capitalism. Now this would be over. Capital's completely real domination destroys the possibility of anything but a communist endeavor. We ought to be a bit wary of the lure of catastrophe theory. When 1914 broke out, and even more so after 1917, communists said that mankind was entering the epic of wars and revolutions. Since then, we have seen a lot more wars and revolutions, and no communist revolution. And we are well aware of the traps of the decadence theory. Only a successful communist revolution one day will allow its participants to say, we've seen capitalism's last days. Until then, the only historical obstacle to the reproduction of the present social system will come from the proletarians themselves. There is no era when revolution is structurally impossible, nor another when revolution becomes structurally possible or necessary. All variations of the ultimate crisis disregard history. They look for a one-way street that could block the avenues branching off to non-communist roads. Yet history is made of crossroads, revolution being one possibility among non-revolutionary options. The schematization of history loses its relevance when it heralds the endpoint of evolution, in this case capitalist evolution, and claims to be a theory to end all theories. In 1934, as a conclusion to his essay on the theory of a collapse of capitalism, and after an in-depth study of the inevitability of major crisis, Anton Ponikuk wrote, quote, The workers' movement has not to expect a final catastrophe, but many catastrophes, political like wars, and economic like the crises which repeatedly break out, sometimes regularly, sometimes irregularly, but which, on the whole, the growing size of capitalism become more and more devastating. And should the present crisis abate, new crises and new struggles will arise. In these struggles, the working class will develop its strength to struggle, will discover its aims, will train itself, will make itself independent, and learn to take into its hands its own destiny, viz. social production itself. In this process, the destruction of capitalism is achieved. The self-emancipation of the proletariat is the collapse of capitalism. End quote. The concept of communization is important enough as it is, without using it to fuel another variant of the last phase of capitalism theory. Our problem is not to prove that we have entered an entirely new epoch when the proletariat can only fight for communism. It is to try and define the concrete process of a communist revolution. A novelty? The communist movement predates the modern proletariat that appeared in England at the end of the 18th century. It was active in the days of Spartacus, Thomas Munzer, and Gerard Winstanley. Fifty years before Marx, Gracchus Babouf's plan had little connection with the growth of industry. Because of his separation from the means of production, which was not the case of a serf, the tenant farmer, however poor they were, the proletarian is separated from the means of existence. Such radical dispossession is a condition of his being put to profitable work by capital. But it also entails that from the early days a proletariat is capable of a revolution that would do away with property, classes, and work as an activity separate from the rest of life. 
The theme of communization is as old as a proletarian struggle when they try to free themselves. Whenever they were on a social offensive, they implicitly and sometimes explicitly aimed at a human community which involved a lot more than better work conditions or merely replacing the exploitation of man by the exploitation of nature. The logic or intention of the 1871 Paris Communards, the 1936 Spanish insurgents, or the 1969 Turin rebel workers was not to develop the productive forces, nor to manage the same factories without the boss. It is their failure that pushed aside community and solidarity goals, discarded any plan of man-nature reunion, and brought back to the fore what was compatible with the needs and possibilities of capitalism. True, so far, past struggles have tried to launch few communist changes in the real sense of the word, i.e. changes that broke with a core capitalist structure. But this limitation was as imposed from outside as self-imposed. The proletarians rarely went beyond the insurrectionary phase, as most uprisings were quickly crushed or stifled. When the insurgents carried the day, they did attempt to live and create something very different from a worker-led capitalism. The limits of those attempts in Spain from 1936 to 1939 particularly were not just the result of a lack of social program, but at least as much due to the fact of leaving political power in the hands of the state and anti-revolutionary forces. What Rosa Luxemburg called in 1903 the process and stagnation of Marxism can help us understand why a deeply entrenched communizing prospect has waited so long before becoming explicit. At the dawn of capitalism, the 1830s and 1840s were a time of far-seeing communist insights. Marx's 1844 manuscripts probably express the sharpest edge of social critique, so sharp that the author himself did not think it necessary to circulate it. The text was only published in 1932. Then, as the worker movement developed against a triumphant bourgeoisie, the communist intuition turned into demonstration and lost much of its visionary force. The 1848 Communist Manifesto's concrete measures were compatible with radical bourgeoisie democracy. Communism is only hinted at in Capitals Volume 1, 1867, and it hardly appears in the Critique of the Gotha Program, 1875. Marx's concern with the real movement led him into a search for the laws of history, and his critique of political economy came close to a critical political economy. He never lost sight of communism, though, as is clear from his interest in the Russian mirror. Quote, if the revolution comes to the opportune moment, if it concentrates all its forces so as to allow the rural commune full scope, the latter will soon develop as an element of regeneration in Russian society and an element of superiority over the countries enslaved by the capitalist system, end quote, 1881. However, as soon as the proletariat resumed its assault on bourgeois society, revolutionary theory retreated its radical momentum. The 1871 Commune showed that state power is not an adequate revolutionary instrument. Then again, the Paris Commune lesson was forgotten until several decades later, the birth of Soviets and councils revived what Marx had written in 1871. In 1975 to 1976, a world without money did not evade the issue of how Marx stood regarding communization, a word and concept he never used. Quote, that Marx and Engels did not talk more about communist society was due, without doubt, paradoxically, to the fact that this society, being less near than it is today, was more difficult to envision but also to the fact that it was more present in the minds of the revolutionaries of their day. When they spoke of the abolition of the wages system in the Communist Manifesto, they were understood by those they were echoing. Today, it is more difficult to envision a world freed from the state and commodities because these have become omnipresent. But having become omnipresent, they have lost their historical necessity. Marx and Engels perhaps grasped less well than a Fourier the nature of communism as a liberation and harmonization of the emotions. Fourier, however, does not get away from the wages system, since among other things he still wants doctors to be paid, even if according to the health of the community rather than the illnesses of their patients. Marx and Engels, however, were sufficiently precise to avoid responsibility for the bureaucracy and financial system of the communist countries being attributed to them. According to Marx, with the coming of communism, money straightaway disappears and the producers cease to exchange their products. Engels speaks of the disappearance of commodity production when socialism comes, end quote. The communist movement owes much to its time. In the early 21st century, 
we would be naive to believe that we are wiser than our predecessors because we realize how destructive productive forces can be. Just as the nature of capitalism is invariant, so are the nature and program of the proletariat. This program, however, cannot escape the concrete needs and mindset of each period. At the end of the 18th century, in a country plagued with misery, starvation, and extreme inequality, and with still very few factory workers, Babouf advocated for an egalitarian, mainly agrarian communism. His prime concern was to have everyone fed. It was inevitable, and indeed natural, for downtrodden men and women to think of themselves as new Prometheus, and to equate the end of exploitation with a conquest over nature. About a hundred years later, as industrial growth was creating a new type of poverty, joblessness, and non-property, revolutionaries saw the solution in a worker-run development of the productive forces that would benefit the masses by manufacturing the essentials of life and free humankind from the constraints of necessity. The prime concern was not only to have everyone fed, housed, nursed, but also in a position to enjoy leisure as well as creative activities. As capitalism had developed, quote, the means of social disposable time in order to reduce labor time for the whole society to a diminishing minimum, end quote. Revolution would be able to, quote, to free everyone's time for their own development, end quote, from Marx, Grandris, 1857 to 1858. Another century later, ecology is a buzzword. Nobody seriously believes in a factory-induced or a worker-managed paradise. New public orthodoxy declares the industrial dream to be a nightmare. So there is little merit in debunking a techno-cult or advocating renewable energy or green building. The idea of communization as a revolution that creates communism, and not the preconditions of communism, appears more clearly when capitalism rules over everything, extensively in terms of space, the much-talked-about globalization and intensively in terms of its penetration to everyday life and behavior. This helps us grasp revolution as a process that, from its very beginning, would start to undo what it wants to get rid of, and at the same time, from its early days, start to create new ways of life, the completion of which would, of course, last a while. This is the best possible answer to the inevitable question, why talk of communization now? One might wonder why the notion hardly surfaced in Italy from 1969 to 1977 when that country came closer than any other to revolutionary breaking point. Part of the answer is likely to be found in the reality of Italian worker autonomy at the time, in theory as in practice. Operism emphasized more the revolutionary subject or agent than the content of the revolution, so the content finally got reduced to autonomy itself. That was linked to the limits of operismo, whose goal was to create or stimulate organization top-down, party-led, or bottom-up, council-based. This may be the reason why a wealth of practical communist critiques and endeavors resulted in so little synthetic theorization of communization. Apart from such hypotheses, it would be risky to embark on sweeping generalizations purporting to explain the misadventures of theory in a particular country by the ups and downs of class struggle in that country. Unless one enjoys being word drunk, there is little fun in playing the prophet of the past. Transition? We would have nothing to object to the concept of transition if it simply stated the obvious. Communism will not be achieved in a flash. Yet the concept implies a lot more, and something totally different. Not simply a transitory moment, but a full-fledged transitory society. However, debatable Marx's labor vouchers are, at least his critique of the Gotham program, 1875, was trying to describe a society without money, therefore without wage labor. His scheme of a time-based currency was supposed to be a provisional way of rewarding everyone according to his or her contribution to the creation of common wealth. Afterwards, when social democrats and Leninists came to embrace the notion of transition, they forgot that objective, and their sole concern was the running of a planned economy. Although anarchists usually reject a transitory period, they laid the emphasis on management via worker unions or via a confederation of communes. In the best of cases when the suppression of wage labor remains on the agenda, it is only as an effect of the socialization of production, not as one of its causes. It is obvious that such a deep and all-encompassing transformation as communism will span decades, perhaps several generations before it takes over the world. Until then, it will be straddling two eras and remain vulnerable to internal decay and or destruction from outside all the more so as various countries and continents will not be developing new relationships at the same pace. 
Some areas may lag behind for a long time. Others may go through temporary chaos. But the main point is that the communizing process has to start as soon as possible. The closer to day one the transformation begins, and the deeper it goes from the beginning, the greater the likelihood of its success. So there will be a transition in the sense that communism will not be achieved overnight. But there will not be a transition period in what has become the traditional Marxist sense. A period that is no longer capitalist, but not yet communist. A period in which the working class would still work, but not for profit or for the boss anymore, only for themselves. They would go on developing the productive forces, factories, consumer goods, etc., before being able to enjoy the then fully matured fruit of industrialization. This is not the program of a communist revolution. It was not in the past, and it is not now. There is no need to go on developing industry, especially industry as it is now. And we are not stating this because of the ecology movement and the anti-industry trend in the radical milieu. As someone said 40 years ago, half of the factories will have to be closed. Some areas will lag behind and others may plunge into temporary chaos. The abolition of money will result in fraternal, non-profit, cooperative relations. But sometimes barter or the black market are likely to surface. Nobody knows how we will evolve from false capitalist abundance to new ways of life. But let us not expect the move to be smooth and peaceful everywhere and all the time. We will only modify our food habits, for example, as we modify our tastes. Changing circumstances go along with changing minds, as was written in the third thesis on Feuerbach in 1845. Our intention is not to create a new man, virtuous, reasonable, always able and willing to master his desires, always respectful of sound dietary rules. About a century ago, chestnuts were the staple food of some rural areas of the French Central Massif. Such a poor diet does not compare favorably with the variety we have become accustomed to in rich countries. But the future is written nowhere. We might well enjoy a more limited range of dishes than the abundance currently sold in the supermarket. Violence and the destruction of the state. As a quick reminder, let us go back in time. For reasons we cannot analyze here, the 1871 communards did not change much the social fabric. That, plus the insurrection being isolated in one city, prevented the communards from really appealing to the rest of the world, in spite of genuine popular support in Paris. Versailles' army superiority was not due to more troops or better guns. Its law and order, pro-property, and anti-worker program was more consistently understood, put forward and fought for by the bourgeois politicians than communalism and social republicanism were by the commune leaders. In Russia, 1917, contrary to the communards, the Bolsheviks clearly knew what they wanted, the seizure of power, and the power vacuum enabled them to seize it. The insurgents did away with a state machinery, which was already dissolving, did not attempt or manage to change the social structure, won a civil war, and eventually created a new state power. In Spain, the July 1936 worker insurrection neutralized the state machinery, but within a few weeks gave political power back to the reformist conservative forces. Thereafter, all social transformations were limited by the pressure of a reconsolidated state apparatus, which, less than a year later, openly turned its police against the workers. In the 1960s, the radical wave opposed the instruments of coercion, but never dispensed with them. The French general strike made the central political organs powerless, until the passive attitude of most workers enabled the state to recover its role. The power vacuum could not last more than a few weeks and had to be filled again. This brief survey reminds us that if, in the abstract, it is necessary to separate social and political spheres in real life, the separation does not exist. Our past failures are not social or political. They were both. Bolshevik rule would not have turned into power over the proletarians if they had changed social relationships. And in Spain, after 1936, socializations would not have ended in disaster if the workers had kept the power they had conquered in the streets in July 1936. Communization means that the revolution will not be a succession of phases. First, the dismantling and destruction of state power, then the social change afterwards. While they are ready to admit this in principle, quite a few comrades, anarchists, or Marxists are reluctant to consider the idea of a communization which they fear would try and change the social fabric while not bothering to smash state power. These comrades miss the point. Communization is not purely or mainly social and therefore non-political, or only marginally political. 
It implies fighting public as well as private organs of oppression. Revolution is violent. By the way, which democratic revolution ever won merely by peaceful means? Fundamentally, communization saps counter-revolutionary forces by removing their support. Communizers' propulsive force will not come from shooting capitalists, but by depriving them of their function and power. Communizers will not target enemies, but undermine and change social relations. The development of moneyless and profitless relations will ripple through the whole of society and act as power enhancers that widen the fault lines between the state and growing sections of the population. Our success will ultimately depend on the ability of our human community to be socially expansive, such as the bottom line. Social relations, however, are incarnated in buildings, in objects, and in beings of flesh and blood, and historical change is neither instantaneous nor automatic. Some obstacles will have to be swept away, not just exposed, but done away with. We will need more than civil disobedience. Passive resistance is not enough. People have to take a stand. Some will take sides against communization, and a revolutionary trial of strength is not just battle with words. States, dictatorships, or democratic are enormous concentrations of armed power. When this armed power is unleashed against us, the greater the insurgent's fighting spirit, the more the balance of forces will shift away from state power and the less bloodshed there will be. An insurrectionary process does not just consist in occupying buildings, erecting barricades and firing guns one day, only to forget all about them the next. It implies more than mere spontaneity, an ad hoc, ephemeral getting together. Unless there is some continuity, our movement will skyrocket today and fizzle out tomorrow. A number of insurgents will have to remain organized and available as armed groupings. Besides, nobody has talents or desires for everything. But if these groupings functioned as bodies specialized in armed struggle, they would develop a monopoly of socially legitimate violence. Soon we would have a proletarian police force, together with a proletarian government, a people's army, etc. Revolution would be short-lived. No doubt this will have to be dealt with in very concrete issues, such as what to do with police files we happen to find. Though revolution may exceptionally use existing police archives and security agency data, basically it will do away with them, as with all kinds of criminal records. Revolution is not apolitical, it is anti-political. Communization includes the destruction of the state and the creation of new administrative procedures, whatever forms they may take. Each dimension contributes to the other. None can succeed without the other. Either the two of them combine or both fail. If the proletarians do not get rid of political parties, parliament, police bodies, the army, etc., all the socializations they will achieve, however far-reaching, will sooner or later be crushed or will lose their impetus as happened in Spain after 1936. On the other hand, if the necessary armed struggle against the police and army is only a military struggle, one front against another, and if the insurgents do not also take on the social basis of the state, they will only build up a counter-army before being defeated on the battlefield, as happened in Spain after 1936. Only a would-be state can outgun the state. Communist revolution does not separate its means from its ends. Consequently, it will not firstly take over or dispense with political power and then only secondly change society. Both will proceed at the same time and reinforce each other, or both will be doomed. Communization can only happen in a society torn by mass work stoppages, huge street demonstrations, widespread occupation of public buildings and workplaces, riots, insurgency attempts, a loss of control by the state over more and more groups of people in areas, in other words, an upheaval powerful enough for social transformation to go deeper than an addition of piecemeal adjustments. Resisting anti-revolutionary armed bodies involves our ability to demoralize and neutralize them, and to fight back when they attack. As the momentum of communization grows, it pushes its advantages, raises the stakes, and resorts less and less to violence, but only a rose-tinted view can believe in bloodless major historical change. At the Caracas World Social Forum in 2006, John Holloway declared, quote, The problem is not to abolish capitalism, but to stop creating it, end quote. This is indeed an aspect of communization. Equally well summed up by one of the characters in Ursula Le Guin's fiction, The Dispossessed, 1974. Our purpose is not so much to make as to be the revolution, quite. But J. Holloway's theory of changing the world without taking power 
empties that process of any reality by denying its antagonism to the state. Like Holloway, we don't want to take power, but unlike him and his many followers, we know that state power will not wither away under the mere pressure of a million local collectives. It will never die a natural death. On the contrary, it is in its nature to mobilize all available resources to defend the existing order. Communization will not leave state power aside. It will have to destroy it. The Chartist's motto, peacefully, if we may, forcibly, if we must, is right only insofar as we understand that we will be forced to act forcibly. In revolutionary times, social violence and social inventiveness are inseparable. The capacity of the proletarians to control their own violence will depend on the ability of this violence to be as creative as destructive. For the destruction of the state, we want to destroy power, not take it. To be more than an empty phrase, negative acts must also be positive, but not creative of a new police, army, parliament, etc. Creative of new deliberative and administrative bodies, directly dependent on social relationships. Who? Quote, The proletarian movement is the independent movement of the immense majority in the interests of that vast majority. End quote from the Communist Manifesto. Both phrases are crucial, independent movement and immense majority. That being said, it does not follow that nearly everyone is a proletarian, nor that every proletarian can play the same part in the communizing process. Some are more apt than others to initiate the change, which does not mean that they would be the leaders of the revolution. On the contrary, they would succeed only insofar as they would gradually lose their specificity. Here we bump into the inevitable contradiction the whole argument hinges around, but it is not an insurmountable contradiction. We do not live in a society where just about everybody is exploited and has the same basic interest in an overall change. Therefore, the same desire and ability to implement what would be a rather peaceful process as nearly everyone would join in, only 3-5% to 5 would object. Castoriadis assured us, but no doubt they would soon see the light. We live neither in a post-industrial society, nor in a post-class society, nor therefore in a post-working class society. If work had become inessential, one might wonder why companies would have bothered in the last 20 years to turn hundreds of millions of earthlings into assembly line workers, crane operators, or computer clerks. Work is still central to our societies, and those in the world of work, currently employed or not, will have better social leverage power at least in the early days or weeks of communization. The contradiction can be solved because, unlike the bourgeoisie striving for political power in 1688, the glorious revolution that gave birth to what was to become English parliamentary democracy, or in 1789, labor is no ruling class and has no possibility of becoming one, now or then. General strike, mass disorder, and rioting break the normal flow of social reproduction. This suspension of automatisms and beliefs forces proletarians to invent something new that implies subjectivity and freedom. Options have to be decided on. Everyone has to find his or her place, not as an isolated individual anymore, but in interactions that are productive of a collective reality. When only railway workers go on strike, they are unlikely to look beyond their own condition. They simply do not have to. In a communization situation, the extension of work stoppages opens the possibility for railway personnel to move on to a different range of activities decided upon and organized by themselves and by others. For instance, instead of staying idle, running trains, free of course, to transport strikers or demonstrators from one town to another. It also means starting to think and act differently about the railway system no longer believing in feats of engineering for progress's sake, and no longer sticking to the view that high-speed trains are super because they're fast. What to do with high-speed trains and with buses cannot be the sole decision of train engineers and bus drivers. Yet for a while, the individual who used to be at the wheel will be more expert at handling and repairing them. His or her role will be specific and provisional. The success of communization depends on the fading away of former sociological distinctions and hierarchies. Breaching professional distances will go together with dismantling mental blocks regarding personal competence and aspiration. The process will be more complex than we expect and more unpredictable. The experience of any large social movement, Germany 1918, Spain 1936, France 1968, 
Argentina 2001 to name a few, shows how volatile the unprecedented can be when the situation slips out of control and creates both deadlocks and breakthroughs. One thing leads to another point of departure for further development. That particular example prompts the question of the fading of the difference between public and private transport, which in turn brings back the vital issue of where and how we live, since today's means of locomotion are conditioned by the urban segmentation of specific areas reserved for administration, habitation, work, recreation, etc. Revolution of Daily Life The trouble with philosophers, Polish novelist Witold Gombrowicz once suggested, is that they do not care about trousers or telephones. That remark hardly applied to Nietzsche, who was no revolutionary but refused to, quote, to treat as frivolous all the things about life that deserve to be taken very seriously. Nutrition, residence, spiritual diet, treatment of the sick, cleanliness, weather, end quote. Ake Homo, 1888. It is everyday life indeed we will change. Cooking, eating, traveling, meeting people, staying on our own, reading, doing nothing, having and bringing up children, debating over our present and future, providing we give daily life its fullest meaning. Sadly, since the phrase became fashionable in 1968, everyday life has been usually limited to the out-of-work time space, as if people gave up hope of altering the economy and wage labor and were contented with altering acts and doings of a lesser kind. Feelings, body, family, sex, couple, food, leisure, culture, friendship, etc. On the contrary, communization will treat the minor facts of existence for what they are, a reflection and a manifestation of big facts. Money, wage labor, companies as separate units and value accumulation centers, work time cut off from the rest of our time, profit-oriented production, obsolescence-induced consumption, agencies acting as mediators in social life and conflicts, speeded up maximum circulation of everything and everyone. Each of these moments, acts, and places has to be transformed into cooperative, moneyless, profitless, and non-status relationships, and not just managed by collective or converted into public ownership. The capital-labor relation structures and reproduces society, and the abolition of this relation is the prime condition of the rest. But we would be foolish to wait for the complete disappearance of the company system, of money and the profit motive, before starting to change schooling and housing. Acting locally will contribute to the whole change. For instance, communizing also implies transforming our personal relation to technique and our addiction to mediation and mediators. A future society where people would feel a constant need for psychologists, therapists, and healers would merely prove its failure at building a human community. We would still be incapable of addressing tensions and conflicts by the flow and interplay of social relations, since we would want these conflicts solved by professionals. Communication is a destruction of repressive and self-repressive institutions and habits, as well as the creation of non-mercantile links which tend to be more and more irreversible. Quote, beyond a certain point, one cannot come back. The tipping point we must reach, end quote, from Kafka. Making, circulating, and using goods without money includes breaking down the wall of a private park for the children to play, or planting a vegetable garden in the town center. It also implies doing away with a split between the asphalt jungle cityscape and a natural world which is now turned into show and leisure places, where the mild hardships of a 10-day desert trek makes up for the aggravating compulsory Saturday drive to a crowded supermarket. It means practicing in a social relation what is now to be private and paid for. Communism is an anthropological revolution, in a sense that it deals with what Marcel Moss analyzed in The Gift, 1923. A renewed ability to give, receive, and reciprocate. It means no longer treating our next-door neighbor as a stranger, but also no longer regarding the tree down the road as a piece of scenery taken care of by the council workers. Communization is a production of a different relation to others and with oneself, where solidarity is not born out of moral duty exterior to us, rather out of practical acts and interrelations. Among other things, communization will be the withering away of systemic distinction between learning and doing. We are not saying that ignorance is bliss, or that a few weeks of thorough self-teaching are enough for anyone to be able to translate Arabic into English, or to play the harpsichord. Though learning can be fun, it often involves long, hard work. What communism will do away with is the locking up of youth in classrooms for years, now 15 to 20 years in so-called advanced societies. 
Actually, modern school is fully aware of the shortcomings of such an absurdity and tries to bridge the gap by multiplying out-of-school activities and work experience schemes. These remedies have little effect. The rift between school and the rest of society depends on another separation, which goes deeper and is structural to capitalism. The separation between work, i.e. paid and productive labor, and what happens outside the workplace is treated as non-work, housework, bringing up children, leisure, etc., which are unpaid. Only superseding work as a separate time space will transform the whole learning process. Here again, and in contrast to most utopias as well as to modern totalitarian regimes, communization does not pretend to promote a brave new world, full of new men or women, each equal in talents and achievements to his or her fellow beings, able to master all fields of knowledge from Renaissance paintings to astrophysics and whose own desires would always finally merge in harmonious concord with the desires of other equally amiable fellow beings. Distant Futures and Here and Now Few people today would agree with what Viktor Sergei, then a Bolshevik living in Moscow, wrote in 1921. Quote, every revolution sacrifices the present to the future. End quote. While it is essential to understand how communization will do the opposite of what Sergei believed, this understanding does not give us the whole picture. One of the strong points of the 1960s and 1970s, or at least one of the best remembered, was the rejection of a revolution that would postpone its completion to an always receding future. In the following years as the radical wave gradually ebbed, the emphasis on the here and now remained, albeit deprived of subversive content and purpose, and was reduced to an array of piecemeal changes in our daily life. When they are as well powerful as they have become, money and wage labor are compatible with, and sometimes feed on, inoffensive doses of relative freedom. Anyone can now claim that a certain degree of self-management of his neighborhood, his body, his parenthood, his sexuality, his food, his habitat, or his leisure time contributes to a genuine transformation society. More genuine, in fact, than the old-fashioned social revolution of yesteryear. Indeed, daily life reformers claim to work for overall change by multiplication of local changes, they argue that step by step, people's empowerment is taking over more and more social areas, until finally bourgeois rule is made redundant and the state rendered powerless. The ex-situationist Raoul Venegan perfectly encapsulated the vision in a few words, also the title of a book of his in 2010, quote, The state is nothing anymore. Let's be everything, end quote. In the aftermath of 68, against Stalinism and Maoist or Trotskyist party building, Radical thought had to combat the reduction of revolution to a seizure of political power and the postponement of the effective change to later days that never came. Thirty years later, Stalinism is gone. Party building is passé, and it is increasingly difficult to differentiate ex-trots from current far leftists. While it pushes dozens of millions in or out of work, today's all-encompassing capitalism wears more often a hedonistic than a puritanical mask. It turns Victor Sergei's formula upside down. Quote, do not sacrifice the present, live and communicate here and now, end quote. Communizing will indeed experiment new ways of life, but it will be much more something other than an extension of the socially innocuous temporary or permanent autonomous zones where we are now allowed to play, providing we do not trespass their limits, i.e., if we respect the existence of wage labor and recognize the benevolence of the state. Commons. The Marxist progressivist approach has consistently thrown scorn on pre capitalist forms, as if they were incapable of contributing to communism. Only industrialization was supposed to pave the way for proletarian revolution. In the past, and still in many aspects of the present, quite a few things and activities were owned by no one and enjoyed by many. Community defined rules imposed bounds on private property. Plowsharing, unfenced fields, and common pasture land used to be frequent in rural life. Village public meetings and collective decisions were not unusual, mostly on minor topics, sometimes on important matters. While they provide us with valuable insights into what a possible future world would look like, and indeed often contribute to its coming, these habits and practices are unable to achieve this coming by themselves. A century ago, the Russian mirror had neither the strength nor the intention of revolutionizing society. Rural cooperation depended on a social system and a political order that was beyond the grasp of the village autonomy. Nowadays, millions of co-ops meet their match when they attempt to play multinationals, 
unless they turn to big business themselves. Our critique of progressivism does not mean supporting tradition against modernity. Societal customs have many oppressive features, particularly but not only regarding women, that are just as anti-communist as the domination of money and wage labor. Communization will succeed by being critical of both modernity and tradition. To mention just two recent examples, the protracted rebellion in Kabylia and the insurgency in Oaxaca have proved how collective links and assemblies can be reborn and strengthen popular resistance. Communization will include the revitalization of old community forms, when by resurrecting them, people get more than what they used to get from these forms in the past. Reviving former collective customs will help the communization process by transforming these customs. Community. Countless and varied visions of a future communist world have been suggested in modern times by Sylvan Marshall, and G. Babouf, Marx, even Arthur Rimbald in 1871, Kropotkin, and many anarchists, the Dutch Council of Communists in the 1930s, etc. Their most common feature may be summed up in the following equation. Communism equals direct democracy equals fulfillment of needs equals community plus abundance equals equality. Since the historical subject of the future is envisioned as a self-organized human community, the big question is to know how it will organize itself. Who will lead? Everybody? A few? Or nobody? Who will decide? The collectivity? Or a wise minority? Will the human species delegate responsibilities to a few persons? And if so, how? We will not go back here to the critique of democracy, which we have dealt with in other essays, and we will focus on one point. Because the vast majority of revolutionaries, Marxists, and anarchists regard communism above all as a new way of organizing society, they are first of all concerned by how to find the best possible organizational forms, institutions in other words, be they fixed or adaptable, complex or extremely simple. Individual anarchism is but another type of organization, a coexistence of egos who are free and equal because each is independent of the others. We start from another standpoint. Communism concerns as much the activity of human beings as their interrelations. The way they relate to each other depends on what they do together. Communism organizes production and has no fear of institutions, yet it is first of all neither institution nor production. It is activity. The following sections only give a few elements on how work could be transformed into activity. No money. Communizing is not just making everything available to everyone without anyone paying, as if we merely freed instruments of production and modes of consumption from their commodity form, shopping made easy, without a purse or a visa card. The existence of money is often explained by the sad, alas, inevitable need of having a means of distributing items that are too scarce to be handed out for free. A bottle of champagne has to have a price tag because there is little champagne produced. Well, although millions of junk food items are manufactured every day, unless I give one dollar in exchange for a bag of crisps, I am likely to get into trouble with a security guard. Money is more than an unpleasant yet indispensable instrument. It materializes the way activities relate to one another, and human beings to one another. We keep measuring objects, comparing and exchanging them according to the average labor time, really or supposedly, necessary to make them which logically leads to assessing acts and people in the same way. The duality of use value and exchange value was born out of a situation where each activity and the object resulting from it ceased to be experienced and appreciated for what it specifically is, be it bread or a jar. From then on, that loaf of bread and that jar existed above all through their ability to be exchanged for each other and were treated on the basis of what they had in common. In spite of their different concrete natures and uses, both they were comparable results of the same practice, labor in general or abstract labor, liable to be reduced to a universal and quantifiable element, the average human effort necessary to produce that bread in that jar. Activity was turned into work. Money is crystallized labor. It gives a material form to a common substance. Up to our time included, nearly all societies have found only work as a means to organize their life in common, and money connects what is separated by the division of labor. A few millennia after abstract labor was born, capitalism has extended worldwide the condition of the proletarian, i.e. of the utterly dispossessed, who can only live by selling his or her labor power on a free market. 
As a proletarian is a commodity upon which the whole commodity system depends, he or she has in himself or herself the possibility of subverting this system. A proletarian revolution can create a new type of social interaction where beings and things will not need to be compared and quantified in order to be produced and circulated. Money and commodity will no longer be the highway to universality. Therefore, communization will not abolish exchange value while keeping use value, because one complements the other. In quite a few past uprisings, in the Paris Commune or in October 1917, permanent armed fighters were paid as soldiers of the revolution, which is what they were. From the early hours and days of a future communist revolution, the participants will neither need, use, nor receive money to fight or to feed themselves because goods will not be reduced to a quantum of something comparable to another quantum. Circulation will be based on the fact that each action in person is specific and does not need to be measured to another in order to exist. Superficial critics of capitalism denounce finance and praise what is known as a real economy. But today, a car or a bag of flour only have some use because they are treated and acted upon according to their cost and money terms, i.e. ultimately to the labor time incorporated in them. Nothing now seriously exists apart from its cost. It is unthinkable for parents who have a son and daughter to buy a car as birthday present for her and a t-shirt for him. If they do, everyone will measure their love for their two children according to the respective amount of money spent on each of them. In today's world, for objects, acts, talents, and persons to exist socially, they have to be compared, reduced to a substance that is both common and quantifiable. When building a house, there is a difference between making sure the builders will not be short of bricks and mortar, which we can safely assume communist builders will care about, and budgeting a house plan, which in this present society is a priori condition. Communization will be our getting used to counting physical realities without resorting to accountancy. The pen and pencil, or possibly the computer, of the bricklayer are not the same as a double entry book of the accounts department. Quote, in the communist revolution, the productive act will never be only productive. One sign of this, among others, will be the fact that the product considered will be particular. It will correspond to needs expressed personally by the direct producers of the time or by others, and that the satisfaction of the need won't be separated from the productive act itself. Let's think, for example, about how the construction of housing will change as soon as standardization appears. Production without productivity will mean that any individual engaged in the project will be in a position to give his opinion concerning the product and the methods. Things will go much slower than today's industrialized building industry. The participants in the project may even wish to live there after the building is finished. Will it be a total mess? Let's just say that time will not count, and that cases in which the project isn't completed, in which everything is abandoned in midstream, maybe because production of the inputs is without productivity too, won't be a problem. Again, this is because the activity will have found its justification itself, independently of its productive result. In a general way, one can say that communization replaces the circulation of goods between associated producers, with the circulation of people from one activity to another. End quote from Bruno Estarian. Critics after dinner. Quote, In communist society, where nobody has one exclusive sphere of activity, where each can become accomplished in one branch he wishes. Society regulates a general production and thus makes it possible for me to do one thing today and another tomorrow. To hunt in the morning, fish in the afternoon, rear cattle in the evening, criticize after dinner, just as I have a mind without ever becoming hunter, fisherman, herdsman, or critic. End quote. From Marx, German Ideology, 1845. This statement has been ridiculed by bourgeois for its naivety and attacked by radicals for its acceptance of objectionable activities, hunting of course, more generally its endorsement of man's domination over animals. An even more critical view might ask why Marx reserves philosophy or art for the evening as an afterthought, as if there is no time for it while producing food, which seems to take up most of the day in Marx's vision. In 1845, Marx was providing no blueprint for the future and he inserted his prejudices and preconceptions of his time. But so do we today, and we would be pretentious to think ourselves devoid of prejudices. The more valid aspect of that statement remains the idea that people living in a communist world will not be tied to a trade or function for life, which still remains the fate of most of us. When this is not the case, mobility is often forced upon us. The least skilled usually get the worst jobs, the poorest pay, 
and lowest social image, and they are the first to be laid off and pressured into a retraining scheme. Besides, multitasking is a way of making workers more productive. As long as work exists as such, that is, as a time-space reserve for production and earning money, a hierarchy of skills will remain. Only the opening up of productive acts to the rest of life will change the situation. Among other things, this implies the end of the present workplace as a specific distinct place, where only those involved in it are allowed in. Scarcity versus Abundance, Prometheus Unbound For many a communist, once again most Marxists and quite a few anarchists, the original cause of the exploitation of man by man was the emergence of a surplus of production in society still plagued by scarcity. The tenets of the argument could be summarized as follows. For thousands of years, a minority was able to make the majority work for the benefit of a privileged few who kept most of the surplus for themselves. Fortunately, despite its past and present horrors, capitalism is now bringing about an unheard of and ever-growing wealth. Thereby, the age-old need and desire to exploit and dominate loses its former objective cause. The poverty of the masses is no longer the condition for education, leisure, and art to be enjoyed only by economic, political, and cultural elites. It is therefore logical that the goal, shared by most variants of the worker movement, should be to create a society of abundance. Against capitalism, which forces us to work without fulfilling our needs and distributes its products in most unequal fashion, revolution must organize a mass production of useful goods beneficial to all, and it can thanks to the celebrated development of the productive forces. Besides, industrialization organizes and unifies the working class in such numbers that they will have the means to topple the ruling class and make a revolution which Roman slaves or late medieval peasants attempted but were incapable of achieving. Moreover, and this is no minor point, if money is the root of all evil, and if scarcity is the ultimate cause of money, such a vision believes that reaching a stage of abundance will transform humankind. When men and women are properly fed, housed, schooled, educated, cared for, struggle for life antagonisms and attitudes will gradually disappear. Individualism will give way to altruism. People will behave well to each other and have no motive therefore no desire for greed, domination, or violence. So the only real question that remains is how to adequately manage the society of abundance, in a democratic way or via leaders, with Kropotkin's moneyless system of helping oneself to goods that are plentiful, and democratic rations sharing out of goods that are not plentiful, or with some labor time accounting as suggested by the Dutch councilists in the 1930s. The answer usually given by anarchists and non-Leninist communists is a society of associated producers run by worker collectives. Whatever the details, all these schemes describe a different economy, but an economy all the same. They start from the assumption that social life is based on the necessity to allocate resources in the best possible way to produce goods. In the genuine and democratically decided interests of all, there lies the difference with bourgeoisie economy. This is precisely where we beg to differ. Women and men must eat among other necessities, or die. There is no denying it. Basic needs do exist. So, of course, we are aiming at society which fairly, soundly, and ecologically matches resources with needs. What we dispute is that human life consists primarily in fulfilling needs, and that, logically, revolution should primarily consist in creating society where physical needs are fulfilled. Human beings only satisfy, or fail to satisfy, all their needs within social interrelations. Only in extreme circumstances do we eat just in order not to starve. In most cases, we eat in the company of others, or we decide, or are led, or forced to eat on our own, which is also in a social situation. We follow a diet. We may overeat or voluntarily skip a meal. This is true of nearly all other social acts. Contrary to the widespread popular misbelief, the materialist conception of history, as exposed in the German ideology, for example, does not say that the economy rules the world. It states something quite different. Social relations depend on the way we produce our material conditions of life, and not, say, on our ideas or ideals. And we produce these material conditions in relation to other beings. In most societies, these are class relations. A plow, a lathe, or a computer does not determine history by itself. In fact, the materialistic conception explains the present rule of the economy as a historical phenomenon, which did not exist in Athens 500 BC, and will no longer exist after a communist revolution. 
The human number one question or the revolution question is not to find how to bridge the gap between resources and needs, as economists would have it, nor to turn artificial and extravagant needs into natural and reasonable ones, as ecologists like us to do. It is to understand basic needs for what they are. Communism obviously takes basic needs into account, especially in a world where about 1 billion people are underfed. But how will this vital food issue be addressed? As Hicks sought to explain in 1998, the natural urge to grow food, potatoes for instance, will be met through the birth of social links, which will also result in vegetable gardening. Communizers will not say, let's grow potatoes because we need to feed ourselves. Rather, they will imagine and invent a way to meet, to get and be together, that will include vegetable gardening and be productive of potatoes. Maybe potato growing will require more time than under capitalism. But that possibility will not be evaluated in terms of labor time costs and saving. Quote, when communist artisans associate with one another, theory, propaganda, etc., is their first end. But at the same time, as a result of this association, they require a new need, the need for society, and what appears as a means becomes an end. End quote. From the 1844 manuscripts. A typical feature of what we have been used to calling the economy is to produce goods separately from needs, which may be natural or artificial, authentic or manipulated, that matters but is not essential at this point, before offering them on a market where they will be bought to be consumed. Socialism or communism has usually been thought of as a symmetrical opposite of that economy. It would start from people's needs, real ones this time, and collectively decided upon to produce accordingly and distribute fairly. Communism is not a new economy, even a regulated, bottom-up, decentralized, and self-managed one. To use K. Polony's word in The Great Transformation, 1944, capitalism has disembedded the production of the means of existence from both social life and nature. No Marxist and certainly not a communist, Polony was not opposed to the existence of a market, but he analyzed the institution of the economic process as a distinct system with its own laws of motion. The Great Transformation, written in the aftermath of the Great Depression, coincided with the capitalist effort to regulate market forces. In the last decades, there has been a renewed interest in Polony's emphasis on embeddedness. Many reformers would like the economy to be brought under social control in order to create a sustainable relationship with nature. Unfortunately, as the liberals are right to point out, we cannot have the advantages of capitalism without its defects. Its regulation is a momentary step before going into overdrive. To do away with capitalist limitation, we must go beyond the market itself and the economy as such, i.e. beyond capital and wage labor. As we wrote in the section on the revolution of daily life, communication will be tantamount to an anthropological change with the re-embedding of organic links that were severed when the economy came to dominate both society and nature. Equality. There would be no communist movement without our spontaneous indignation when we witness a Rolls Royce driving by slums. So von Marshall, Babu's comrade, wrote in the Manifesto of the Equals, 1796, quote, no more individual property in land. The land belongs to no one. We demand, we want, the common enjoyment of the fruits of the land. The fruits belong to all. We declare that we can no longer put up with the fact that the great majority work and sweat for the smallest of minorities. Long enough, and for too long, less than a million individuals have disposed of that which belongs to 20 million of their like, their equals. End quote. S. Marshall's statement was asserting the existence of a human species whose members are similar and should have a fair share of available resources. Communization demands a fraternity that involves, among other things, mutual aid as theorized by Kropotkin. And equality is expressed in the international lines, there are no supreme saviors, neither God, nor Caesar, nor tribune. But equality is not to be achieved by bookkeeping. As long as we measure in order to share out and equalize, inequality is sure to be present. Communism is not a fair distribution of riches even if, particularly at the beginning and under the pressure of circumstances, our priority may sometimes be to share goods and resources in the most equitable way, which, whether we like it or not, amounts to some form of rationing. 
Our prime motive and mover will not be the best and fairest way to circulate goods, but our human links and the activities that result from them. Universality. Where do capitalism's powerful drive and resilience come from? Undoubtedly from its amazing and always renewed capacity to invent advanced ways of exploiting labor, to raise productivity, to accumulate and circulate wealth, but also from its fluidity, its ability to supersede rigid forms, to remodel hierarchy and discard vested interests when it needs to, not forgetting its adaptability to the most varied doctrines and regimes. This plasticity has no precedent in history. It derives from the fact that capitalism has no other motive than to create abstract value, to maximize its flows, and eventually to set in motion and accumulate more figures than goods. That aspect is documented enough for us not to go into details. What matters here is that capitalist civilization develops extreme individualism while creating a universality of sorts, which is also a form of freedom, of which democracy is a political realization. It breathes and favors a new type of human being potentially disconnected from the ties of tradition, land, birth, family, religion, and established creeds. In the 21st century, the modern Londoner eats a banana grown in the West Indies, where she was holidaying last week, watches an Argentinian film, chats up an Australian woman on the internet, rents a Korean car, and from her living room accesses any classical or outrageously avant-garde work of art, as well as all schools of thought. Capitalism is selling her no less than an infinity of possibilities. Fool's gold, we might object, because it is made of passivity and spectacle in the situationist sense, instead of truly lived-in experience. Indeed, yet, however speeches this feeling of empowerment, it socially functions as it is able to arouse emotion and even passion. We would be wrong to assume that a period when communization is possible and attempted would automatically and quickly eliminate the appeal of false riches, material or spiritual. Two centuries of modern capitalist evolution have taught us how resourceful that system can prove. In troubled times, social creativity will not only be on our side. In order to ride out the storm, capitalism will also put forward authenticity and collectiveness. It will provide the individual with opportunities to go beyond his atomized self. It will suggest critiques of formal democracy, defend planet Earth as a shared heritage, oppose cooperation to competition, and to use appropriation. In short, it will pretend to change everything, except capital and wage labor. The communist perspective has always put forward an unlimited development of human potentials. Materially speaking, everyone should be able to enjoy all the fruits of the world, but also in the behavioral field, in order to promote, harmonize, and fulfill talents and desires. The surrealists, absolute freedom, and the situationists, to live without restraints, went even further and extolled the subversive merits of transgression. Today, the most advanced forms of capitalism turn this critique back on us. Current political correctness and its empire of good leave ample room for provocation, for verbal and often factual transgression. Let us take a look at the many scenes that surround us. Compared to 1950, the boundary is increasingly blurred between what is sacred and profane, forbidden and allowed, private and public. English readers had to wait until 1960 to buy the expurgated version of Lady Chanterley's Lover. Fifty years later, online pornography, whatever that word covers, is widespread. According to some figures, 12% of all sites and 25% of internet searches deal with pornography. Contemporary counter-revolution will appeal much less to moral order than it did in the 1920s and 30s, and often have a liberal, libertarian, and permissive, transgressive flavor. Communization, on the other hand, will prevail by giving birth to ways of life that will tend to be universal, but not dominated by addiction, virtuality, and public imagery. The Inescapable Contradiction Communization will be possible because those who make the world can also unmake it. Because a class of labor, whether its members are currently employed or out of a job, is also the class of the critique of work. Unlike the exploited in pre-capitalist times, wage earners can put an end to exploitation. Because commodified men and women have the means to abolish the realm of commodity, it is the working class slash proletariat duality we are talking about. A class, as Marx put it in 1844, 
which is not a class, while it has a capacity to terminate class societies. Marxists often turn this definition into formulaic dialectics. Non-Marxists make fun of it. The French liberal Raymond Aron used to say that the working class is worthy the fine name proletariat when it acts in a revolutionary way that suits Marxists. Anyone who takes this definition seriously cannot evade the obvious. This duality is contradictory. Those who handle the modern means of production and have thereby the ability to subvert the world are also those with a vested interest in the development of the productive forces, including utterly destructive ones, and are often caught up willy-nilly not just in the defense of their own wages, shop floor conditions and jobs, but also of industry, of the ideology of work, and the myth of progress. We have no other terrain apart from this contradiction. It dramatically exploded in January 1919 when a few thousand Spartacist insurgents went to battle amidst the quasi-indifference of several hundred thousand Berlin workers. Communization with a positive resolution of the contradiction. When the proletarians are able and willing to solve the social crisis by superseding capitalism. Therefore, communization will also be a settling of scores to the proletarian with him or herself. Until then, and as a contribution to this resolution, communist theory will have to acknowledge the contradiction and the proletarians to address it.